Mayor Tom Henry. Decision Fort Wayne. Fort Wayne's NBC News, the first to call the mayor's race. Democrat Tom Henry fending off challenger Tim Smith to win a fourth term as mayor. We have become a shining beacon in the state of Indiana. No longer is Indianapolis the talk of our state Fort Wayne is. Smith conceding at Republican headquarters. I called the mayor, of course, and congratulated him. It is quite obvious that the people of Fort Wayne are very pleased with how things are going. And that's a wonderful thing. Our crews behind the scenes gathering reaction and joining us live in studio for analysis are newly elected Democratic City Councilwoman Sharon Tucker and Republican Councilman Russ Yale, who won another term tonight. A special election night edition of Fort Wayne's NBC News starts now. Live from Television Park, this is Fort Wayne's NBC News at 11. All of the votes are in. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Decision Fort Wayne. I'm Linda Jackson. And I'm Tom Paul. We're glad you're here tonight. We are focused on the Ford and the races that matter to you in Fort Wayne and Allen County. We have team coverage for you tonight. Our Jeff Newmeyer is covering the Democratic Party as they react to the results of the Fort Wayne mayor's race. And reporter Corinne Rose, she's at Republican headquarters for their reaction. And finally, our Ariel Cadet will bring us results from a very close race for city council at large. But first, the big race of the night, incumbent Democrat Tom Henry defeating Republican challenger Tim Smith and securing a fourth term as mayor of Fort Wayne. Let's go ahead and take a look at the final results in the race for Fort Wayne mayor. Incumbent Democrat Henry securing 61% of the vote. His Republican challenger Tim Smith taking about 39%. And so you know, voter turnout is up significantly, it seems, over last time. About 31% of registered voters showed up at the polls. Compare that to about 22% in 2015, the date of the last city election in Fort Wayne. It is a sign of quite a few competitive races on the ballot for certain. Let's turn things over now to Fort Wayne's NBC reporter Jeff Newmeyer, who is at the Grand Wayne Center in downtown Fort Wayne tonight for the mayor's acceptance speech. Jeff. Democrats gathering at the Grand Wayne Center for their election night watch party and lots of reason to celebrate the biggest reason buying win here on election day. From the Grand Wayne Center and the Democrat uh, election night party, I'm Jeff Newmeyer reporting. All right, Jeff. Well, Henry's opponent, Republican Tim Smith, criticized the mayor on three specific issues this year, safety, infrastructure, and jobs. Yeah, he used those topics to run an aggressive campaign in the months leading up to Election Day. Fort Wayne's NBC reporter Corinne Rose reports from GOP headquarters. Allen County Republicans, of course, feeling the stinging defeat of Republican challenger for mayor Tim Smith. To in four years, whether he might run for mayor again, he says if the voters of Fort Wayne call on him to run, that's something he will definitely consider. Reporting from Republican headquarters, I'm Corinne Rose. All right, Corinne, thank you. Now that Fort Wayne voters have made their decision and the votes are in, it's time to provide some live analysis. We're joined live in studio by Fort Wayne City Councilman Russ Yale, Yale, who won another term as the representative of the 2nd District tonight. As well by Democrat Sharon Tucker, who also ran unopposed in her City Council race, winning a seat for District 6. And our first question for both of you, uh, we'd like to know your thoughts on the mayor's race. And Councilman Yale, we'll begin with you. Yeah, I think there were two major factors. One, um, there's no way around this. It was a bad night for the Republican Party. I agree with Councilman Yale that the negative campaigning had a um, adverse effect. Uh, we've seen it work the opposite direction sometimes, but I was glad that the voters saw through a lot of the um, a lot of the message that was put into the negative campaigning. We, we saw a wide <laughs> Thank you for coming and we, we both appreciate it. We could talk with them all night. Yeah, we could. Oh, definitely. Uh, we turn now to the city council at large race and the city council members who will be representing all of Fort Wayne. Yeah, here's a look at the winners and how the numbers broke down. The top three vote getters, Republican Tom Freistoffer, 
with about 18%, Democrat Glenn Hines with 17%, and Democrat Michelle Chambers with just under 17%. Tonight as well, incumbent Republican Michael Baranda lost his seat as an at-large councilman with 16%, and Democrat Steve Corona took just under 16%. Republican Nathan Hartman also defeated with about 15%. Our Ariel Cadet spoke with the winning Democratic candidates this evening and brings us their reaction to this very tight race. She too joins us from the Grand Wayne Center downtown. Ariel? Well, Tom Linda, I'm here at the Grand Wayne Convention Center. I just finished talking with Michelle Chambers and Glenn Hines, who have won the two at-large seats on the council, with Democrats taking the four come January 2nd. For now, I'm Ariel Cadet at the Grand Wayne um, Convention Center, Fort Wayne's NBC. All right, thank you, Ariel. On the Republican side, incumbent Tom Freistroffer was able to hold on uh, to his council at large seat. Here's what he had to say after his victory. We uh, are looking forward to another four years of keeping the economic development uh, moving in the city. I, I'm looking forward to working with the, the uh, at large uh, members that won. Freistroffer says he wants to make neighborhoods a priority during his next term in office. Now let's take a look at the other contested city council district races in the fort. Beginning in District 1, incumbent Republican Paul Ansley able to hold on to his seat with 58% of that vote, defeating Democratic challenger Misty Meehan, who took 42% of the vote. In District 3, another Republican incumbent, Tom Didier, easily defeated Democratic challenger John Henry. Didier taking 64% of the vote. Henry 36%. This will be Didier's fifth term in office. Let's take a look now at the fourth district race with a close one coming down to just a few hundred votes. Republican Jason Arp holding on to his council seat with 51% of the vote. Democrat Patty Hayes taking about 49% of Our the vote. Our final contested district was District 5 in the race between incumbent Jeff Paddock and political newcomer Taylor Vanover. Democratic Councilman Paddock secured his third term in office with 74% of the vote tonight. Republican Vanover with 26%. And we'll take a look at at the end of this year. We are focused on the Ford and on Allen County. You'll find full local election results online at fourwingsnbc.com and on our Facebook page. But we're not finished yet tonight. After the break, we'll bring you more analysis with the vice chair of the Allen County Democrats on a strong night for that party. Also, still to come on Fort Wayne's NBC News at 11. Great weather this election day at the polls, but what about the rest of the week? Chief Meteorologist Chris Daniels will join us after the break. My fellow Hoosiers, what started out as a understandable and needed, quite frankly, response to the disgusting, gross, violent and fatal injustice against Mr. George Floyd has turned into anything but a proper time of mourning. Governor Eric Holcomb addressing the state today as Hoosiers react to the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis. We have live team coverage for you tonight. Good evening, everyone. It is a busy night of news. I'm Linda Jackson. And I'm Tom Powell. Thanks for being here. We know many of you were wondering today whether the protests would continue downtown. Well, here is your answer. This is a live look in front of the Allen County Courthouse right now. We'll see, have to see how this situation develops as the night moves on. Well, now we hear from the state's leaders. Governor Eric Holcomb holding a special news conference at 1.30 this afternoon alongside Indiana State Police Superintendent Doug Carter. They each took to the podium with messages for Hoosiers. Every breath that we take, every breath that we have left, should be devoted to making sure what happened to Mr. Floyd never happens again. Please do not blame the frontline law enforcement officers that are sacrificing so much and would die for the very people that have so badly damaged our communities. I and so many others like me around our great nation must hold our officers accountable and you should expect nothing less of me. Among reporter questions, Nikki Kelly from the Fort Wayne Journal Gazette asked why tear gas was thrown when people were blocking streets. Superintendent Carter said state police stand with citizens during peaceful protests, but things change when people break the law. Brigadier General Dale Lyles, commander of the Indiana National Guard, confirmed that the Guard did have a presence Sunday in Fort Wayne following Friday and Saturday night's violence downtown. 
Melinda Mayor Tom Henry addressing our local protests in the statement again today. In the statement, the mayor says that the city mourns with those protesting the death of George Floyd. He did not address specific incidents, but says that Fort Wayne PD and other law enforcement made, quote, difficult decisions that they believed were necessary to maintain order. The mayor concludes the statement saying, quote, Fort Wayne is a city like no other. By working together, we'll be a stronger and more caring and giving community. It will take some time and healing, but I have no doubt that our best days are ahead of us. Yesterday's protest started out peacefully until about 11.15 last night when police say someone fired gunshots into the air by the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Bridge. Police say they gave orders for protesters to leave the area. They say those who would not leave were arrested. We've asked police how many people they arrested, and we are still waiting for a response to that. Someone gave you the exact description said you were shooting in the air. I, well, I never saw anything. No? No, sir. I promise you. Okay, I'm going to roll you over. One of last night's arrests, Sean Johnson, this man, charged with misdemeanor resisting law enforcement, and it was captured on his Facebook Live. We caught up with him before his initial court hearing today. He says the person who fired shots did so in a different area, and when he walked over, police asked the crowd to leave the area. Johnson says there was a brief argument when he claims police used non-lethal force to push them away. At that time, Johnson says he ran. Police maintain they did not use chemical agents or other munitions. Johnson tells us a police officer followed him and yelled for him to stop, so Johnson gave himself up. He says police told him they thought he was the one who fired the shots. Uh, officer looks at me, oh, it was definitely him. Why? Because I'm African American and I have a red hoodie? That makes me guilty? I don't think that's right. We're sick and tired of being sick and tired. And when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, you do something about it. Johnson was able to show police his Facebook Live, proving that he says he wasn't in the area when the shots were fired. They did not charge him for that crime, but he does still face charges tonight. A Fort Wayne protester spoke with us this afternoon about what he calls an unexpected interaction with officers Sunday night. As Fort Wayne's NBC reporter Corinne Rose explains, the man says at the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Bridge last night, he thinks the two sides began to see each other as humans, not adversaries. Police were nice enough to come out here and just, just kind of talk, bounce around. And meaningful interactions can happen rather than the violent ones that happened Friday and Saturday. Corinne Rose, Fort Wayne's NBC. Peaceful protests turned into violence in downtown Fort Wayne and after many windows had to be boarded up, especially Saturday night. Business owners are having to prepare those and many more things, Tom. Yeah, Fort Wayne's NBC reporter John Wilson talked with a Jimmy John's franchisee who leases a building downtown for his businesses. Uh, he joins us live in studio with that part of our team coverage tonight. John. Yeah, Tom and Linda, Friday evening started off typical for the Jimmy John's franchisee I talked with. It didn't end that way, though. So after police department at 260-427-1222. All right, John, thank you. Other businesses downtown taking down boards from destroyed windows this morning to install replacements. Crews had previously boarded up the windows both to cover up the damage and also as a precaution against future damage. Uh, we caught up with a worker from Home Enterprises taking down boards for a building owner. Uh, owner of this owns quite a few more buildings down here. There's only like so two out of her six buildings were vandalized. And the rest they just put up just to be safe? Yeah. The work there began at 6.30 this morning. Linda? Well, Tom, there's another aspect of the protest to consider, and that is the financial burden on cities and their police forces that are providing security and crowd control. At times, officers fired tear gas canisters and deployed other chemical agents to control crowds that police felt had crossed the line. Local government will have to pay over time as well to hundreds of officers who worked extra shifts and things like tear gas, concussion grenades and riot gear that gets damaged will have to be replaced. Mayor Tom Henry says he and his administration will have to deal with those issues. At the same time, the pandemic is causing financial problems for local government. We have a, a positive cash balance, and some of the items as we're getting ready to prepare our 2021 budget, uh, I think some of the impacts that we will see will not be so much immediate as they will possibly in future years. We didn't need to tear gas or rubber bullet people, and that was, that, that was just uncalled for. City police say they have not deployed rubber bullets, that some officers have fired what are called baton rounds for crowd control. 
but we are told that has been used very infrequently. Well, stay with Fort Wayne's NBC News for continuing coverage of the protests. Our coverage will remain focused on the fort on the air online as well at fortwaynesnbc.com. Check out our social media pages as well. Just search for Fort Wayne's NBC. This incident has probably caused the sheriff to have a little humility. I hope so. A special prosecutor filing misdemeanor battery charges against Sheriff Gladio, offering the sheriff a pretrial diversion. And he indicated that that is what he would do with any other person. But Gladio maintaining his innocence. Um, he has not pled guilty to any crime. He has not admitted any guilt to a crime. Tonight, people in Fort Wayne responding to these new developments. Some people are going to think we were too harsh on him. Some people are going to think he got a slap on the wrist. So what's next for the Allen County Sheriff? I don't think that this one incident uh, should uh, perhaps portray the entire law enforcement career of David Gladio. The Sheriff Charged. Our team coverage starts right now. Live from Television Park, this is Fort Wayne's NBC News at 6. The special prosecutor appointed to investigate Allen County Sheriff David Gladio announced the result of that probe but is it what people want? Thanks for being with us. I'm Linda Jackson. And I'm Tom Powell. We have team coverage for you tonight. Our Jeff Newmeyer is taking a look at what's next for the Sheriff's Department with reaction from our community. Corinne Rose broke the news this morning. She brings us the official count of events and what went into the special prosecutor's decision. She begins our team coverage tonight. Corinne, what did the special prosecutor tell you? Well, Tom, this all stems from an incident during the Three Rivers Festival where Sheriff Gladio's attorney admits Gladio had been drinking before getting into an altercation with a teenage festival volunteer who fell and was hurt. The special prosecutor and state police detective a public apology and complete alcohol treatment and anger management programs. Now, an alcohol treatment program is, is telling, right? While Gladio was never given a breathalyzer test that night to measure his blood alcohol content, both sides say the sheriff had been drinking. Prosecutor Cummings says anything that Gladio may have said, either to the teenager or to any other officers nearby, is mitigated by his written apology. Mm. Interesting. Uh, what I think this was the investigator said. Some people are going to think we were too hard on him. Some people are going to think he got a slap on the wrist. Mm -hmm. That is what we are seeing play out mm -hmm. right now in the comment section on the Facebook. Page. Well, I think like anything, you can yeah. never please all the people all the time. Mm -hmm. But what the investigator from the state police and the special prosecutor told me today was that with faced with the evidence that they had, it did not meet the criteria for a felony. It met the standard for a misdemeanor charge, a class A misdemeanor mm -hmm. of battery. You've been on top of this yes. story. We appreciate your coverage. Sure. Thanks, Thanks Corinne. Corinne. Well, Gladio's attorney sending what he says will serve as his written apology soon after Cummings filed charges as required in that pretrial diversion agreement. That apology from Gladio reads in part, and I quote, in retrospect, I believe that I could and should have handled the entirety of the situation with more professionalism. For that, I am deeply sorry. It then goes on to say, quote, I am willing to accept full responsibility for my actions by accepting the conditions set forth by a pretrial diversion agreement, end quote. The sheriff does not directly address the victim, by the way. Gladio's attorney says until this case is dismissed under the terms of the agreement, the sheriff will not make any statements on camera. All right, will it be difficult now for the sheriff to maintain the public's confidence in his leadership after what happened? Was the prosecution handled the correct way? Well, those are just a couple of the questions our Jeff Newmeyer tackles in this story. In his apology, the sheriff accepted that he should be held to the highest standards of conduct. He went on to Jeff Newmeyer, Fort Wayne's NBC. Now, the family of the young boy who was allegedly battered by Gladio has taken some initial steps, we understand, to pursue a civil lawsuit against the sheriff. So what do the people of Fort Wayne have to say about all this? Was justice done? Fort Wayne's NBC spoke with several people at Promenade Park for their reaction. Maybe as the sheriff he gets special treatment. Um, I think that's a little too special. Do you have confidence in, in him as the sheriff yeah, now? Yeah. yeah, I do. We'll have more on the community's reaction tonight on your news at 11. And we'll continue to update you on any future developments in this case. Stay with Fort Wayne's NBC News on the air, online, and on social media for the very latest.
at 11. An unimaginable twist in the search for that missing girl in Gas City. It's now a case of murder. Tonight, as the suspected killer, the victim's own stepmother, sits behind bars. I wish there were words that we could say that would heal the hurt. A vigil to remember a life cut far too short. It's hard. It's really hard. That vigil taking place in Gas City after a horrifying discovery in the middle of the night turned the search for a missing 10-year-old girl into a murder investigation. Good evening, I'm Linda Jackson. And I'm Tom Powell. Skylie Carma uh, Carmack's stepmother, Amanda Carmack, is now in jail. More on the charges she faces in just a moment. Earlier tonight, we brought you live team coverage of our Jeff Newmeyer live in Gas City. Reporter Corinne Rose profiling the accused stepmother. We'll hear more from our Caitlin Kendall, who tells us what a neighbor said she saw days before police say they found Skylie's body. And Fort Wayne's NBC reporter Ariel Cadet will have more on that memorial that took place tonight in just a few moments. First, though, we want to walk you through the details of this case. State police found the 10-year-old's body in this shed, stuffed in a plastic bag in their backyard. Police believe she had been strangled Saturday afternoon, the day her stepmother reported her missing. Today, state police revealed that 34-year-old Amanda Carmack, the stepmother, is tonight behind bars in Grant County. She faces four preliminary counts, including murder, strangulation, and neglect of a dependent resulting in death. So you might be asking why wasn't their property, including that shed, searched thoroughly before? State police told us they treated this as a missing person search at first. Then new evidence that later came in, including video from cameras in the neighborhood, caused them to change their focus. Here's more from police and from an ex-wife of Skyly's father, who says she always felt close to the girl. Gas City, Grant County, is an area that cares, an area that loves. They wanted to bring this young lady home safely, but unfortunately, those aren't the results we got. To try to rationalize why someone would kill a 10-year-old, there's no rationale for that. That's just an act of cowardice. I never anticipated any of this, and I know that Kevin is, is honestly a good dad, and it's hard to know everything that's going on when you're not home very often. But I feel like he should have listened more. Police say the father, Kevin Carmack, has not been charged. State police tell us Amanda Carmack reported Skyly missing to authorities in person, and they believe Amanda Carmack acted alone. After learning about the 10-year-old's death, some people in Grant County began to drop off stuffed animals and other items. During our time in Gas City tonight, that makeshift memorial outside the home continued to grow, becoming what you see here. And then, this evening, many of the same community members who'd searched for young Skyly came together once again, only this time to mourn and to begin to try and heal. Now, Fort Wayne's NBC reporter Ariel Cadet was at a candlelight vigil tonight. She joins us with more from that gathering. Ariel? Linda, Tom, there was not a dry eye in the crowd tonight. Hundreds gathered to pay tribute to Skyly, and some even traveled from different cities to attend. All of them told me they were sad and even angry when they heard the news of the, her death this morning. With candles in the air, police say helped provide new evidence that changed the nature of the investigation. Our Caitlin Kendall has more on what one neighbor claims to have seen while the investigation was still taking place. Caitlin? Ariel, neighbors and friends turned out by the dozen to help search for Sky Lee before police say they found her body in a shed in her backyard. That shed is the same place where neighbors clearly shocked at this horrific development. Tom, Linda. Caitlin, thank you. Several of the stepmother's posts are raising some eyebrows on social media. Yes, yeah, some seeing her words as missed warning signs, others as a cry for help. Carmack posted several times a week on her Facebook page, but never about the fact Skyly was missing. From Carmack's posts, it appears her husband was frequently out of town for work, leaving up to seven children in her care, ranging in age from 13 to 3. Carmack also posted several times about having depression and wrote, quote, I'm at the end of my rope. I don't disagree with her Facebook posts. My sadness is that she didn't go get help for that, or none of her friends on her Facebook post reached out for help for her. It's not just one factor. It's a confluence of many factors. You just don't see one thing that says, I'm going to kill you. And then you may end up psychotic, and then you're out of touch, and then you do. You may end up killing your child. Experts we talked with say they feel for the other children who'd been under Carmack's care because 
they will have to live with this for the rest of their lives. Now, experts say if you are feeling stressed, caring for a child, there is no shame in asking for help. You can call your police department, fire department, or even 911. SCAN also works with agencies in 34 counties. Call 1-800-752-7116, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That number again is 1-800-752-7116. Well, we'll continue to follow the tragedy of 10-year-old Skyly Carmack, the missing girl murdered. You can find our full team coverage at FortWayneNBC.com. Tonight, Fort Wayne's NBC News is covering all of the angles with team coverage throughout the day. This morning, you heard from our Kent Horman as teachers boarded buses at our local UAW Union Hall. Now we have a report from our Jeff Newmeyer, who was in Indianapolis for the rally itself. You'll hear from state lawmakers as well as teachers and parents demanding action. Our Corinne Rose will join us live in the studio to show us how the teachers who stayed behind still made their voices heard today. And our Louis Tran will join teachers as they return to the fort back from the rally. He'll talk with them about whether they feel their presence at the State House will sway lawmakers. Yes, Henry Underwood found not guilty on all charges. Our Jeff Newmeyer joins us now from the courthouse with the latest on this. Jeff? Yeah, Tom, Linda, just in the last five minutes or so, we've gotten the word that uh, Henry Underwood found not guilty, murder, felony murder, attempted robbery, and there's quite a scene outside of the, the courthouse. Several members of the uh, Miles, Terrence Miles family, right now yelling at the defense lawyers as they try to get out of the courtroom. And in fact, they're, uh, right now some of the members of the Miles family are sort of like they're approaching the defense lawyers and very upset. Some of the courthouse uh, security guards are protecting those lawyers as they walk past. Again, not guilty for Henry Underwood on all three charges in the uh, murder of Terrence Miles. Back to you guys. This is Fort Wayne's NBC News at 6. Uh, we are seeing a downward trend. This report uh, is very positive. This mayor who plays politics with public safety is doing everything he can to make it look as good as it possibly can look. No more lies. Tell the truth. It's shaping up to be the issue in the Fort Wayne mayor's race, crime. What is being done by our city leaders and is it enough? Good evening. I'm Linda Jackson. And I'm Tom Powell. We're glad you're here tonight. We're hearing from all sides of this issue tonight. Mayor Tom Henry, whose campaign has made it a point to paint Fort Wayne as one of the safest cities in the Midwest. His Republican challenger, Tim Smith, who says the mayor has neglected public safety and members of a local victims advocacy group. Fort Wayne's NBC News sat down with the mayor and police chief Steve Reed to go over the most recent crime statistics available. They emphasized the 75% homicide clearance rate, which they define as homicides where someone has been charged, the act was ruled self-defense, or a person of interest was killed in another homicide investigation. Now here are some other numbers Henry and Reed are choosing to highlight tonight. Mayor Henry says he believes the city is moving in the right direction. So I think we're making significant progress. Again, thanks to our police department and thanks to organizations, as the chief said, like the uh, Fort Wayne United and the Ten Point Coalition. The credit for these numbers go to the hardworking men and women of the Fort Wayne Police Department. They're out there doing their job every day, and it's because of them uh, we're, we're seeing this. Mayor Henry also pointed to the passage of the 2020 budget, which he says will allow Fort Wayne Police, the Fort Wayne Police Department to have 480 officers patrolling city streets. Republican Tim Smith's campaign responding tonight, saying these statistics don't tell the entire story. Fort Wayne's NBC News caught up with the candidate this afternoon for his take on the state of crime in the fort. Smith criticized Henry for not hiring what he sees as enough officers on the streets, and he accused the mayor of manipulating data, as he put it, to fit his campaign message and, quote, playing politics with public safety. They're bragging about statistics through nine months. What if the last quarter of the year is horrible? What if it's tragic? Will they conclude then that whatever they've employed and deployed has failed? Pursuant to a study only two and a half weeks ago, not only are we not the fifth safest city in America, as he falsely claims, we are the 41st safest city in the state of Indiana. 
Smith says if elected, he would hire more police officers and focus on community oriented policing. A local advocacy group also making their voices heard today at noon in what they called a flash mob protest at Citizens Square downtown outside the mayor's office. Members of Java, that's what the group is called. They say the, they are the victims and are the ones caught in between the conflicting mayoral campaigns. They say they want action, not just talking points. Mayor Henry says he supports their right to protest, but feels the numbers disprove their point. We want him to know that there are people out here that know there is a problem. And if he wants to continue to hide his head in the sand, um, there, there's a problem and it's not gonna be solved if he continues to hide his head in the sand. I, I, I fear for our city next year if he gets reelected and still continues to deny that there's a, a crime problem. I, I believe that the message was wrong. Uh, I think that they were receiving misinformation. All right, so you've heard from both sides. Now, what do you think? Do you feel safe in the fort? Drop us a comment on this story on the Fort Wayne's NBC Facebook page. And be sure to stay with Fort Wayne's NBC News through Election Day as we remain focused on the fort through our special report conversation with the candidates. We'll chat with Smith and with Henry about their visions for the fort. That's coming up Monday, the night before Election Day. They heard a whistleblower who came out with a false story. You know, people say, oh, it was fairly close. It wasn't close at all. To preserve our Constitution, our democracy, our basic integrity, he should be impeached. Wildly different opinions today in Washington on whether President Trump committed an impeachable offense in his July phone call with the Ukrainian President Zelensky. House Democrats say they are preparing for a flurry of subpoenas in the face of President Trump and Trump's administration's stonewalling of their impeachment investigation. When former Vice President Joe Biden for the first time today called for the president's impeachment, the president immediately fired back in a tweet calling the speech, quote, pathetic, going on to say, and I quote again, I did nothing wrong. Joe's failing campaign gave him no other choice. House Democrats are planning a conference call Friday to update all members of that party on the impeachment inquiry before Congress returns to Washington, D.C. next week. And during this recess, Republicans in Washington, including those representing you here in Indiana, have come to the president's defense, claiming President Trump hasn't done anything impeachable. Today, Fort Wayne's NBC News spoke with 3rd District Congressman Jim Banks, as well as U.S. Senators Mike Braun and Todd Young. They are all from Indiana. They are all Republicans. And our Ariel Cadet brings us their reaction to those latest developments in Washington. The Trump administration calls the Democrats' impeachment inquiry illegitimate. Congressman Banks, along with Senators Young and Braun, agree. They don't think there is enough there for impeachment. Three of Indiana's top elected officials representing you in Washington, all Republican. There's nothing there. What do you think about the process and whether it should move forward? Congressman Banks will hold a town hall tomorrow at 9 a.m. at the Winona Lake Town Hall building open to all members of the public. All right, Ariel, thank you. We also asked those lawmakers about the developing situation in the Middle East. Today, Turkey launched a major military operation in northern Syria against a longtime U.S. ally, the Kurds. The attack comes days after President Trump ordered U.S. troops out of the region. Critics worry the Kurds, abandoned by the U.S., will be slaughtered by the Turks and will have no choice but to abandon ISIS prisoners that they have been guarding. I sat down with Congressman Banks, who has called the abandonment of our Kurdish allies, quote, cruel. Having served in the Navy himself, he says he fears the pullout may lead to the resurgence of ISIS in that region. There is a lot at stake, and we, we can't abandon the people that have been on our side and working in the interest of, in our interest of fighting against ISIS. President Trump is hearing from a lot of people currently. I, I understand his sentiment to pull American troops out of harm's way and, and needless, endless conflicts and wars around the globe. I don't think this is one of those situations. Now, Senator Young said he's waiting to hear more information before making his judgment on the situation in Syria, but believes other nations should step up in the meantime. Senator Braun agrees and claims that by pulling our troops out of the fray, the president is fulfilling a campaign promise. He says it shouldn't just be American blood defending the Kurdish people. Fort Wayne's NBC News will continue to follow these political developments from around the world in ways that matter to you most. Stay with us on air, online, and on social media for the latest.